Thank you to everyone for being here, for being present. Um, and thank you especially to Shara Lin, who I see as a kind of brilliant goddess of the literary world <laughs> in the Bay Area. She makes the impossible happen again and again. And I want to also thank Women's Lit for making this happen as well in general. Um, Terry, <laughs> it's wonderful to be with you here. Um, Terry is an old friend from nearly 30 years, and I remember meeting you um, when Refuge came out mm. in 91, you know, at a, at a beautiful book party, which we still remember as a very special time. Um, and we were very young back then, both of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have just watched her emergence, and I just encourage you to look at Refuge, an unnatural history of time, of... of um, of family and place, and it really just took the bottom from all of us who read it. Um, it just made you see the world in an entirely different way than before. There was a before refuge and an after refuge, mm -hmm. and you created that. Um, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful. And, the, and I work on the commons, as, as Sherilyn mentioned, and I want to also recommend The Hour of Land, which is absolutely a stunning uh, book of celebration of many, many of the beautiful parks we have and the public lands and the public commons. And today we're here to celebrate this stunning achievement that Terry has done. I, I go into total panic when I see all of those. Yeah, <laughs> that's what everybody's why laughing. I, think, I was wondering why people just, were laughing. <laughs> if there are any students of the Gia's, can you please come up now? I'm <laughs> terrified. I love these tiny little post-it notes. <laughs> um, it's called Erosion, Essays of Undoing. Um, and it's really, you know, both many, many layers of depth. It's, I felt as if I was, in a way, in the Grand Canyon. Um, and you were taking me through many, many different trails. And you were showing us all the different layers of your thinking and the layers of our own all of our collective well-being or non-well-being in the world as we see it today. And I think the word erosion is, is so powerful. Um, and what I was stunned is how you created a kind of positive and negative aspect of erosion, which was surprising to me. You know, I didn't expect that. Um, and one of the things that's really been beautiful about your work is, and the, your voice is that there's a deep geography of feeling that makes it so unique that you think and feel like a braid on the surface of words. Um, and that is just, you know, that's been always something I've, whenever I hear Terry speak, I hear that in her voice. And whenever I read her, I also hear that in, her, in, the, in the words as well. And it's extremely rare and unique to you, I think. And it helps us as the reader and as the listener to also begin feeling deeply as well. Because so much of the world today is... Uh, in a way, the, the cutout of the feeling mm -hmm. and the cutout of the emotion um, is almost like a binary operation. And so to be able to have the presence of mind to be able to listen to our feelings and listen to our emotions and follow them like a bird, like she does, um, or an owl, um, is, is an in incredible gift mm -hmm. you know, for us. So I wanted to start with... Um, just to say, I know there are a lot of writers here, and as writers, we always have a question of other writers, and that is, I met you as a writer, um, and I think Refuge was like your fifth or sixth book, right? Almost. Um, but I would love to know, like, if you could lay a few seeds of writing for us, of how you became a writer, um, what is that story? Could you share some of that with us? First of all, I just want to thank you. I mean, um, a 30-year friendship, you and Lee, I so honor um, how you both create community, and this is a beneficiary of what community looks like. And I just honor your work and your voice and your thank daughters you. and your marriage and who you are to all of us. So can we just honor... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, Sherilyn, all of you, um, Malcolm, 
as part of this community, what you've done for all of us as writers with Heyday and your presence. Um, you are one of the great ones among us, and we honor you. And Brooke and I are just so thrilled to be in this community of openness and depth and rigor. Writing. Um, you know, I don't consider myself a writer. Oh, and <laughs> that's a surprise. <laughs> you know, I think writing is an expression of, of being in the world for me. Mm. Um, I consider myself a teacher, a storyteller, a member of a community engaged. And I, I do write. And I think of Susan Griffin, mm -hmm. who is here tonight, and she has been a mentor of mine. And I remember, and this has everything to do with writing. I remember my beloved grandmother. Um, she was raised Mormon in a rural community. She married a non-Mormon who was an atheist. And I think at 50, she had a very close to a nervous breakdown. Um, because her mind was so expansive, and yet the world that she found herself in was very small, and she broke out of that. And I think she wanted that for me. And, you know, she studied Jung, she followed Krishnamurti, went to Ojai, um, secretly went to Big Sur and Esalen. Um, <laughs> secretly. Secretly. <laughs> She Probably had tough. a passport to go to India, which her husband finally, my grandfather, put his foot down. And these are all things that she really didn't share. But one thing that she did share, there was a wonderful radical bookstore in Utah called Cosmic Airplane. Cosmic Airplane. Yes. And it was my grandmother's favorite bookstore. And she would take us there in a clandestine you know, way. And... She looked to the bookstore, you know, at the different shelves, and she saw Woman and Nature by Susan Griffin. And she pulled out the book, I remember the cover vividly, and she looked through it and she said, this is what I want to get you. Mm. And she bought it for me, inscribed it, and took me home. I was in college, barely. I think I was 18, um, maybe older. I started to read it, and I was so terrified of those words. I remember I thought the pages were on fire. Mm -hmm. And about the subjugation of women, the subjugation of earth, all the things I knew growing up in this culture that said women had no voice. And I threw the book in the garbage can. It was too terrifying. And then I thought, I cannot do this because my grandmother wrote in it. <laughs> and I can't do that to a book. And I picked it back up, and about six months later, maybe a year, I sat down, I lit a candle, and I read that book, and it mm. changed my life. And I realized I had to have, I had to find the kind of courage that this woman had to tell the truth. Mm. And when Refuge was about to be published, I thought, who would I dare ask for a comment? Mm -hmm. And I found Susan's number, and I remember being terrified, and I called her. <laughs> and generously, you gave me a comment. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if I have Susan's name on this book, I can go forward with half the courage that you have. And I could never have imagined that how many years later, 20, 25, that Susan, Maxine, Hong Kingston, and others, that we would be sharing a jail cell <laughs> in an act of civil disobedience. <laughs> To me, that's what being a writer is. Mm. And <laughs> it comes back to you and Lee, because you were the ones that brought us back to Berkeley again and again, so that we could meet this community of friends, um, and Grace Paley, and 
so many others. So I feel like this is what a writing life is, is a life engaged with community who stretches you, um, believes in you, and holds you. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. It reminds me so much of what Grace Paley used to say, that writing was a form of, it was an act, but it was not an exclusive act by itself. It was an act that was engaged with all the other acts that she was in, and why people would isolate her as a writer versus as a person who was living, you know, mm -hmm. on the kitchen table and raising her family and in the strikes and in the jails and all that, so yeah. Which is what you do. You know, I look at the breadth and depth of your life and all you carry for so many. Thank you, thank you, Terry. Um, I wanted to ask you, because this is the, a really nice segue to um, my next question, which I love your book, The Open Space of Democracy, mm. um, which I think is just an incredible, I mean, I saw you at that stage really, I mean, you had always been a citizen in that big C, but that period of your life, you were like a citizen in a whole other way to the 10th power, you know, and I watched you try to understand what is the shape of the democracy that we live in today and what are the edges of that and how do we shape the democracy to reflect who we actually are. And I wanted to ask you about that because we're at a, of course, a crucible at the moment politically, economically, culturally, ecologically, aesthetically, right now. And I'm curious, how would you, I don't want to use the word update, but how would you, you know, arc the book, The Open Space of Democracy, to today? And what kind mm. of, because a lot of, you know, of course, erosion is in dialogue with The Open Space of mm. Democracy, and, you know, I want to bring you to a particular story that I, am, you know, is very moving, but I wanted to ask you in terms of, um, what your thoughts are, and, and even in terms of your being in jail with Maxine and Susan and others. In 2003, mm -hmm. it was against the, the, uh, anti, the Iraq war. So I just want to know, like, that was your, Gan it's your Gandhian self, right? You're pushing the edge of civil disobedience. And had you done that before? Was that the first time? Have you done it since? How many times? What was the experience of being in prison for your ideas? I mean, when I think leaves? about, and thank you for that, when I think about the open space of democracy um, that was written during, you know, the end of the, well, during the Bush-Cheney regime, yeah. which yeah. I now, we all look back with great fondness. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. Strange how that happens. <laughs> I think, why am I feeling these beautiful feelings toward George Bush? You know, I can't say that I, I can extend that to Dick Cheney, but, but at least there were laws, maybe. I don't know. I, th I think we're eroding and evolving at once. And I remember um, the first essay was a commencement address given in my, uh, at my alma mater, mm -hmm. um, the University of Utah, with my niece graduating and my family there. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, um, you know, I thought that that was a moment. I, I just remember saying, you know, patriots act. They don't sign a piece of paper and comply. And given the patriots act, and it was this idea of question, stand, speak, act. And for me, my first, I think my politic, my politicization, how do you say that? Politicization, yeah. Um, was really crossing the line at the Nevada test site on behalf of the women in my family, speaking of women lit, mm -hmm. um, the clan of one-breasted women, nine women in my, in my family have all had mastectomies, seven are dead. Um, that was the moment for me that I think I became a writer in that, in that deepest way. But I remember um, at the end of that speech, you know, there were, it's graduation in Utah, and there were 15,000 people, and half the people stood up and booed. That takes a lot of energy. I tried it in our backyard, you know. It <laughs> um, and our senators were there, Orrin Hatch and Senator Bennett, who was our Mormon bishop. Brooke and I were not active and aren't, even though we're culturally present. Um, and I remember he, he looked at me and he said, how dare you when men and women are giving their lives to this war? Mm -hmm. um, my question for you is, 
what are you willing to die for? And That's what he asked you. He asked me that right in that moment. You know, mm. what are you willing to die for? Mm. And I thought about it for a long time. And I finally wrote him back. Um, I think the graduation was in May. I think in November I finally wrote him back. And I said, you know, Senator Bennett, that isn't the question for me. It's not what I would die for, but what I would give my life to. Mm. And that is freedom of speech. Mm. And I think that's where every basis is, and I think that's what's so terrifying right now, is that people are afraid. Mm -hmm. And I think for those of us who do have voices, for those of us who have privilege, it's imperative that we do speak. You ask, where are we now? You know, what would be the next iteration of this? Mm -hmm. And may I read something? Of course, yes. Uh, this would be the way I would answer it. I can't look at your book. <laughs> <laughs> That's just too <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> it's just, it's just, um, let me, I'm just shaking. Uh, let me find it. I know this book from the inside out. I don't know it from the outside in. Um, you know, we all know our home ground, and I'm from Utah, Brooke and I, five, six generations. And I, I have a friend, Fuzzle Sheikh, who's a photographer. Mm. Um, his father is Kenyan, his mother American, mm. he is a citizen, but after September 11th, he did not feel safe as a Muslim, and he now lives in Switzerland. I met him several, two years ago, not long, mm. and admire his work deeply. Um, for example, he's traveled all over the world, and one book, he spent years um, photographing Israeli people and Palestinian people, and created these diptychs. You cannot tell the difference. Mm. Anyway, we were talking, we didn't know each other, and what came out of my mouth was, why don't you come home? And he, he looked at me and he said, you don't know me, you know? And I said, but you're traveling all over the world, why don't you come home? There is a real conflict here, many conflicts, and we need you. Mm. And he said, there is no place for me here. And I said, why don't you come to Utah? I wish you could have seen the look on his face. <laughs> 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 and I talked to him about Bear's Ears and what was happening with the oil and gas and, you know, that these lands were, were imperiled and what, what would he see here, mm. given what he saw, has seen in Rwanda, in Palestine, um, Afghanistan. And he was offended on some level. And it, the breakfast ended abruptly. That was in May. In July, the phone rang. I picked it up and he said, damn you. <laughs> and I thought, hello? <laughs> I thought it was one of our neighbors, you know? Um, and he said, this is Fuzzle. Can I come? And he came a week later and we went down to Bears Ears. I was able to introduce him to some of the tribal members and elders. They trusted him, and he stayed for four months photographing from the air, aerial. We looked at maps, and he's still doing his work there and has made an extraordinary difference. But there was a moment after he had been flying for four months, taking pictures, that he called me and he said, I have been traveling all over the world, you're right. And Utah is the most violent place I have ever seen. And that undid me, and I became defensive. I know our state. I know about nuclear testing. I know about the tar sands mine in the book cliffs. I know about IMAX and the, the toxins that are leaching into Great Salt Lake. Fracking, frack lines, oil and gas drilling, uranium, Topaz Mountain, but I had never put them together. And this, this would be the next incarnation, Vigia, of the open space of democracy. 
What is beauty if not stillness? What is stillness if not sight? What is sight if not an awakening? What is an awakening if not now? The American landscape is under assault, and this will take about seven minutes. The American landscape is under assault by an administration that cares only about themselves. Working behind closed doors, they are strategically undermining environmental project protections that have been in place for decades and getting away with it, in practices of secrecy, in deeds of greed, in acts of violence that are causing pain. Like many, I have compartmentalized my state of mind in order to survive. Like most, I have also compartmentalized my state of Utah. It is a hidden violence that we all share. This is the fallout that has entered our bodies, nuclear bombs tested in the desert, boom. These are uranium tailings left on the edges of our towns where children play, boom. The war games played and nerve gas stored in the West Desert, boom. These are the oil and gas lines, frack lines from Vernal to Bonanza in the Uinta Basin, boom. This is Anath and Montezuma Creek, the oil patches on Indian lands, boom. Gut bear's ears, boom. Cut Grand Staircase Escalante in half, boom. And every other wild place that is easier for me to defend than my own people and species, boom. The coal and copper mines I watched expand as a child, Huntington and Kennecott, boom. The oil refineries that foul the air and blacken our lungs in Salt Lake City, boom. And the latest scar on the landscape, the tar sands mine in the book cliffs, closed, now hidden, simply by its remoteness, boom. At Cisco Desert, where trains stop to settle the radioactive waste, they carry on to Blanding, boom. Move the uranium tailings from Moab to Crescent Junction, then bury it still hot in the alkaline desert, out of sight, out of mind, boom. See the traces of human indignities on the sands near Topaz Mountain, left by the Japanese internment camps, boom. President Donald J. Trump will try to eviscerate Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante monuments with his pen and poisonous policies. He will stand tall with other white men, who for generations have exhumed, looted, and profited from the graves of the ancient ones, they will tell you Bear's Ears belongs to them. Boom. This is a story, a patronizing story, also a condescending one. I see politicians and Mormons discounting the tribes once again, calling them, quote, Lamanites, unquote. The rebellious ones against God, dark-skinned and cursed, that is their story. Racism is a story. The Book of Mormon is a story. Boom. Perhaps our greatest trauma living in the state of Utah is the religiosity of the Mormon patriarchy that says, as I was told growing up, that we had no authority. Women, Indians, black people, brown people, gay people, trans people. It was only those who were white and male, who could hold the priesthood over us, telling us the way to heaven was only through them. Boom. All my life I was told I could not speak, that I had no voice, no power, except through my father or husband or bishop, and then there was the prophet. Boom. I refused to perpetuate this lie, this myth, this abuse called silence. If birds had a voice, so did I. Environmental racism is the outcome of bad stories, a byproduct of poverty. In Utah, yellow cake has dusted the lips of Navajo uranium workers for decades, who are now sick or dead. Boom. There is no running water in Westwater, a reservation town adjacent to Blanding. Local municipalities refuse to provide Navajo families with a basic human right. Boom. But we are not prejudiced. Boom. If you speak of these oversights, call them cruelties. We, as Mormons, are seen as having betrayed our roots and our people. These are my people. Boom. This is who I am. Boom. A white woman of privilege, born of the covenant. I am not on the outside, but inside. Boom. It is time to look in the mirror and reflect on the histories that are mine that are ours. Boom. We are being told a treacherous story that says it is an individual's right, our hallowed state's right, to destroy what is common to us all, the land beneath our feet, the water we drink, the air we breathe. 
our bodies and the body of the state of Utah, this nation is being violated. Our eyes are closed, our mouths are sealed. We refuse to see or say what we know to be true. Utah is a beautiful violence. Do we dare to see Utah for what it is? An elegant, toxic landscape where the power of oppression rules by repression? Our proving grounds of fear? What are we afraid of? Exposure. Boom. Our denial is our collusion. Our silence is our death. The climate is changing. We have a right and responsibility to protect each other. Resistance and insistence before the law. Boom. We are slowly dying. We are ignoring the evidence. Awareness is our prayer. Beauty will prevail. Native people are showing us the way. It is time to heal these lands and each other by calling them what they are, sacred. May a Congress of Ravens greet us in ceremony. May we recognize our need of a collective healing, a blessing by earth. May we ask forgiveness for our wounding of land and spirit, and may our right relationship to life be restored as we work together toward a survival shared. A story is awakening. We are part of something so much larger than ourselves, an interconnected whole that stretches upward to the stars. Coyote in the desert is howling in the darkness, calling forth the pack, lifting up the moon. Thank you for that question. Um, I hadn't realized the trajectory um, and the anger. And how do we take our anger and turn it into sacred rage? You know, talking to Willie Gray Eyes, I remember asking him um, after Bear's Ears, what do you do with your anger? And he said, Terry, it can no longer be about anger, it has to be about healing. And I've been thinking a lot about that, what that means, that that is not a passive act, but to really get to the source of what is causing the pain so that we can heal. Also, I think one of the, I mean, this was in a way a song of grief. This is a song, it's not working or it's, yeah. Um, it's a song of grief. And one of the powerful like threads, I think, both in erosion and in refuge and the hour of land, is the movement through grief and through the other, the anger, grief, and through the other side into action. And I think, I mean, Joanna Macy talks about this, you know, Susan Griffin talks about this, many writers talk about this, many activists talk about this. And I think, you know, your, I mean, our ability, our both individual and collective ability to experience grief and rage, and pain, and then to take that and make it into something, into the next step. Like and joy. And joy. Exactly. You know, I feel like joy, grief, and love are siblings to joy, mm -hmm. you know? I mean... And beauty, too. Beauty. Yeah. yeah. What do you, and we know each other well enough, I feel like I can ask you this question, <laughs> what do you do with your grief? Who's who interviewing whom here? No, no. This is a conversation. <laughs> you know. I know. What do I do with my own grief? I mean, um, I think, you know, if, you know, I love that phrase E.L. Doctorow says about writing that, or being, that sometimes you can't see more than the headlight of the car. And so for me, it's even in the middle of grief or in the middle of sadness, or pain is if I can see the next step, the next iterative move to mm -hmm. make even in the depth of darkness, then I, I know what to do. You know, the hardest thing is to not have that any light. Right? And mm -hmm. so that's what I I guess that's you know, when I'm then sometimes you are in that deep darkness where you don't see a light. 
But the hope is that, you know, a single light bulb comes or a kerosene lamp comes or mm -hmm. the sun comes again. Mm -hmm. That's the good thing about the night is there's always the day. Mm -hmm. There's always the sunrise. And I think also in terms of Hinduism, there's a, you know, until very recently, most people didn't have electricity. And even I, you know, when I was going back to my grandparents' ancestral home in India when I was there, when I was living there, um, I watched the first light bulb come into the village. Mm. And I had, you know, just come from America also, but we were going back, and we lived there for two years in India and spent three months in my grandparents' ancestral home. And there was a priest, and they did a ritual with the first light bulb, and there was no cover. It was like just a simple, you know, you could see all the wires. And then three months I was there, and I realized that nobody had turned it on. <laughs> and... <laughs> And we were just going back to America and the next day, and I, and I said, I'd better ask people, you know, I was 11 years old, it was 1972, and I said, oh, you know, why didn't you turn on the light bulb? And they looked at me and they said two things that I remember. One, they said, you know, it was too expensive, whatever it cost, so they didn't have the cash to pay. And second, more importantly, they said, was we couldn't figure out what to use it for. <laughs> And it became a decoration, you know, it was like, wow. a, like wow. we have a light bulb, but we don't turn it on, you know. <laughs> so I think there's a way in which, I mean, we think of darkness, I mean, Toni Morrison talks about this beautifully, that we think of darkness and night as evil. Mm. And that's where like black and brown people are considered, mm. you know, not the same as white, because we have this dichotomy even in the nature of color. And I think we have to break out of that, even mm -hmm. in terms of the way we see what is darkness? What is right. grief? You know, um, is it always black? You know, is it always brown? Or is it? So I think that's also another, uh, mm -hmm. you know, angle of vision mm -hmm. into that question. But thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to turn the tables back onto you. <laughs> um, I wanted to just, I mean, you talk so beautifully about the desert and the canyon lands. And it was such a shock in your book to see the oil drills the images of them, and then especially with the boom, what you, what you read. And I was curious, you know, one of the things I was always struck by, both two friends, Ivan Illich and Chandraleka, they both spoke about proportionality. Like how, as a human being, we see ourselves in relation to the sky. Um, and are we aware of our sense of proportionality to the largeness outside? Um, and... Even when you see this in art, you see Jesus holding the earth, like sometime in the 13th century, as a globe in his hand. And it also matches our human tendency to think of the earth as a ball, as something that we are greater than the earth. Um, and so I was just curious, like when you're in the desert, how do you relate to that sense of infinity and that expansiveness? And um, do you think that's something that's essential for us as human beings to go to places where we can see our smallness rather than the human being overshadowing the natural world? Which is not real, but that's how it appears to us, you know, mm. most of the time. I mean, Brooke and I were talking about, you know, when we moved to the desert 20 plus years ago from Salt Lake City, how that really changed us mm -hmm. and created a sense of stillness inside us mm -hmm. because that's what the desert brings, is that sense of stillness and proportion mm -hmm. and exposure. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy to live there. Flash floods, you know, fire, um, which you all certainly know about, um, extreme heat, extreme hold. Um, cold, where we are, the temperature, it can be up to 112 in the summer, and it can go down to 22 below. So there's a huge um, range. And I, I think one day, you know, the desert will take the words out of me. Um, mm. What do you mean by that? It's very beautiful, very poetic. <laughs> well, I just... It's the silences, it's the stillness, um, mm -hmm. it's the erosion. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's that everything is alive. I, I mean, we just learned there were some um, seismologists from the University of Utah that there, where we live, um, there's a 400-foot monolith of Entrada sandstone, Castleton Tower, maybe some of you have been there. It's a climbing site, as well as this phenomenal presence that towers over our valley, literally. Um, some seismologists from the University of Utah enlisted two climbers, and they took a seismometer at the base of the tower, climbed and placed it up at the top of the tower. And what they found was that Castleton Tower has a pulse mm -hmm. that is in direct relationship to our own heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So what those of us who live in the valley had always intuited um, was verified scientifically. Mm -hmm. Castleton Tower is alive. Now, one of the scientists said, well, not exactly. But to me, you know, the fact that it has a pulse, that it registers um, waves, hurricanes, motorcycles, and, and the, the pulse of liquid at the core of the earth, mm -hmm. in between the core and the surfaces. Isn't that unbelievable? That's incredible. So yeah. to me, that's what the desert mm -hmm. invites us into, is mm -hmm. this, this penetrating vibrational presence. Mm -hmm. And the desert is often defined by what it isn't. It is not green. There is no water. Um, we had a friend come not long ago who said, may I bring my new partner? Um, I want you to meet her. And we said, absolutely, our doors are wide open. They came, we had this wonderful night, you know, looked at the stars, had a great dinner, great conversation, we all went to bed. In the morning, too early, I heard this stirring. I thought, what's going on? I get up, and his friend, she has her bags packed, and she is standing, ready to go. Wow. And I said, are you okay? And she said, no. This is too quiet, too remote, too everything. <laughs> and within minutes, we were, you know, walking them out to the car just a little after dawn. She gets in the car, she rolls down her window, and she says, aren't you afraid you're going to be forgotten? Mm. And what I wanted to say was, I hope so. <laughs> 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 and I think that's what the desert shows us and prepares us for is it's, it's, not a, it's not about do I worry that we'll be forgotten, it's what am I going to forget? Mm -hmm. And the desert returns us to that place of, of remembrance. Um, even in the death of my, my brother, Vijaya. Mm, I wondered if you wanted to bring that up, but I'm glad you did. Yeah. And, you know, I feel I can share this with this audience. We've, we've shared a lot of things for a long time through the years. Um, and I hadn't planned on sharing this. But my brother Dan, um, beautiful human being, worked with birds of prey, eagles, red-tailed hawks, falcons, um, banded them during migration. He also suffered from mental illness, from depression. And he also was a working man, his hands calloused. You know, he went up to the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota thinking he would come back rich. He came back shattered like so many. Mm. And we came homeless and um, things worsened. And, I, you know, he, he hung himself. And um, his death by suicide had teeth. And months before he passed, he said something, and really it's at the heart of this book. He said, Tara, I'm eroding. Mm -hmm. And he just said, you're in denial. You know, mm -hmm. and he, I will just say, he said, I'm fucked, you're fucked, the earth is fucked, I'm on my way out. Mm -hmm. And what I said to him is, Dan, I will never give up on you. I will never give up on the earth. And... And we had this very intense, beautiful conversation, heartbreaking conversation. And um, you know, you think you can, the arrogance of thinking you can save a piece of land or a species, when in fact, I couldn't even 
I help my brother. Um, and this is not a blame, it's just where we are. This was where he was. But here's what I wanted to share with you. My youngest brother, my remaining brother, Hank, had made a promise to Dan that Dan had told him, I've been buried too long, I want sky. Please cremate me, which is against the religion of the Mormon church. And so Dan and I, Hank and I, um, went to the mortuary. The mortician was a high school friend of mine. This is what happens when you grow up in a place, right? <laughs> and he was acting deaf, you know, very sad. And I said, Guy, did you know him? I mean, it was like, let's be real, right? That he had found his calling. We were there. Um, and we said, could we, we want to see Dan's body? And he said, I don't think that's possible. And I, I said, and why not? And he said, well, it's just not possible as we prepare him for cremation. And I said, why? And he said, well, he's shrink wrapped. You know, and you think, well, we can take that off. And he said, well, it will take time. You know, it was mm -hmm. we, all we have is time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll make this shorter. Um, we were able to be with his body. That's one of the most incredible sections of the book. And it's we just... were able to place feathers in his hands, mark his body with sunflower petals, and, and say prayers. And I felt his spirit, and Hank felt his spirit. And then I thought we were, we were done, that we would release him and leave. But my younger brother said no. And when the man who was performing the cremation said, you know, thank you for being here, my youngest brother said, we are staying. And I thought, we are? <laughs> and we stayed yeah. for the six, almost seven hours. And it was one of the most powerful experiences I have ever witnessed. And when they opened those doors and we saw our brother's body and his rib cage that looked like prayer flags with this Mormon man who was in charge of the cremation with welding gloves, doing a dance of separating the bones, raking the bones, almost mm -hmm. like a Zen master. Of and then watching him take the bones of our brother tray by tray into the next room and feeling the heat of our brother's life. Yeah, when he asks you to do that, do you want to? It was so yeah. powerful. And then he yeah. left and left us with the bones of our brother. And I remember saying to Hank, what are you thinking? And he said, probably the same thing you're thinking. Are these coyotes' bones? Are these ravens' bones? Are these rabbits? Mm. And I thought, you know, that's what the desert brings to us. There is no hierarchy in death. And my brother, our brother Dan, would have loved that. Mm -hmm. And when we watched this beautiful man grind the bones into fine ash mm -hmm. and weigh them, 8.2 ounces. Or pounds, right? Yeah. Eight pounds, two Today, ounces. Yeah. It was the weight that Dan was at birth. That's incredible. The same weight as a gallon of water in the desert. I mean, to me, this is what the desert prepares us for. This is what working with red-tailed hawks and mm -hmm. eagles translates to. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what allows us to not look away. Mm -hmm. No, that was one of the most stunning, beautiful threads of the book. And it also like, showed, revealed how you carve beauty in that grief and in that pain, that chapter. As oh. you were talking about, you know, with the light, even the flames. Mm -hmm. And we don't have this in our culture at large. And I think we can ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, in talking to Mr. Raby, he said, you know, in the 800 plus cremations he had done, which is a lot in Mormon country, yeah, yeah. 
No one had ever asked to watch. Yeah, and I felt sad that I hadn't watched my father's. But I don't I think we that. knew we had the option. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly yeah. this room was not designed for that. We were in a cardboard box storage unit with a furnace. But I think these are the things we can ask for. Yeah. And had it not been for the promise that Hank had made to Dan, I would not have had the courage to do that. Yeah, yeah. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to end with the story of the forester who discovers something about these giant sequoias um, and how she deals with that. Um, and I wanted you to share a little bit of that story because I think that's a great way to end this beautiful conversation. And I think, yeah. it, again, life. Mm -hmm. How many of you know Sue Beatty? She... Um, was the chief biologist in Yosemite National Park, an amazing woman. And we met um, during the, the celebration of the national parks in 2016. And she invited us, Brooke and I, to walk among the Mariposa Grove, which, as you know, was the first really public lands um, set aside by a war-torn president, Abraham Lincoln, um, a year after Gettysburg. We also know the Indian Wars, the Mariposa Wars, attached to Yosemite. Sue Beatty, every, maybe every week, she would walk through the Mariposa Grove just to find her own peace. There was one particular walk, and these are my words. Um, as a biologist, she would describe it differently. Mm -hmm. But she was walking through the trees and she felt a disturbance. And she couldn't quite put her finger on it. And she just kept walking faster and faster. And she looked around and she thought, something is not right. And in her heart, what she heard was, we are suffering. Mm -hmm. We are dying, can you hear us? We are suffering, we are dying, can you hear us? And she just kept walking and she noted things how dry it was, how unnaturally still it was. And she went back the next, and it bothered her all weekend. She went back to her office, and she could heal, still hear that. We are suffering, we are dying, can you hear us? And what she said to her staff was, we need to do a complete assessment of the health of the Mariposa Grove. Mm -hmm. And her colleague said, but we know it's drought. And she said, I think it's something else. After a, a year, two year long study, what they found was the trees were in fact dying. That after over a hundred years of millions of people's feet, the roots had been tamped down. Yeah. And they literally could not breathe. And so what they did, based on their data, was they decided they would take, do, talk about radical, they would take out all of the pavement. They would take out the trolleys. They would they would reimagine the Mariposa Grove not as a place of recreation and tourism, but a place of restoration and reverence. And the superintendent and the powers that be agreed. And so for four years, the trees were able to rest. It was closed to the public, miles of asphalt removed, water table was restored, Parking lot, gone, no more trolleys, no more concessionaires. And now, when you go to the Mariposa Grove, it is a place of reverie. And if you go there, you see a sign that says, can you hear the trees speaking? Beautiful. So I think when we think about in this very difficult time, you know, what can we do? I think each of us in our own way can listen to what is called for. Hank was going to witness the burning of our brother. Sue Beatty listened to the trees and acted. So I think the question tonight I would leave you with is how do we go deeper, each in our own way, each in our own time, with the gifts that are ours? 
And I have watched you do that for decades. And I've watched you do that for decades. <laughs> Terry, thank you so much. And we're going to open it up right now to questions from the audience. Okay? Yes, Great. absolutely. Yeah. And yes, you are welcome to, you're welcome to come line up on either side um, with Vanessa or myself if you have questions for Terry. Terry, I'm curious, knowing that you're at the Harvard Divinity School, how that experience is affecting your life, your thinking, your writing. Just seeing you makes me weep. This is beloved Toby McLeod, who's a dear, dear friend. Uh, how is the Harvard Divinity School changing me? I think I'm acutely aware of all I don't know. Um, I'm learning so much. I'm also learning what it feels like to be away from home. The most, uh, Brooke and I have never been away from Utah for more than four months. I mean, I. I will speak for myself. I've never been away from Utah for more than four months at a time. You know, and I'm 64 years old. So I'm working there full time, Brooks part time. So I miss my family. I miss the desert. We're there six months in Cambridge and then six months in, in, in Utah. Um, I'm learning to listen to the trees. There are a lot of trees there. And I'm loving the students. You know, Toby worked with our students at the University of Utah um, in a program that we had, which was the last semester I was able to teach. I was fired from the University of Utah for political reasons, for um, Brooke and I purchasing oil and gas leases. And it broke my heart. Um, so what am I learning? I think I'm learning that there's a larger world I think I'm learning that though I don't have a Harvard education, I have an education of the land and knowing the names of things like Willow Flycatcher and Colorado River. And I'm learning that the students that come to the Divinity School are not there to be ministers or pastors as much as engaged citizens who want to do good. And I'm learning that there is a need for a climate curriculum in, at the Divinity School, that if we cannot begin to see these issues of Earth and social justice and environmental justice as Earth justice, then religion becomes irrelevant. And that is exciting to me. The other thing I'm learning is I can speak freely without reprimand. And I have not known that. So thank you. Malcolm. So in terms of listening, have you, have you, have you, have you, have you listened to the Indians, to, 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 native, to, to, to native people? And, 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 I'm sorry about this. It's, it's, it's 12 years of Parkinson's. So, so what have you learned? Thank you, Malcolm. You know, you have so much opened this conversation for us with the Olani way. And I would say to you that in the last 10 years in particular, um, I have been listening. And working with tribal members, especially in the Diné or Navajo, with the Hopi and the Zuni, um, Pueblo people and the Ute people, um, working together on behalf of Bears Ears National Monument has been one of the most meaningful aspects of my life. And I think it has changed all of us. And 
it goes back to what Willie Gray Eyes was saying when I asked him, what do we do with our anger? And when he said, it can no longer be about anger, it has to be about healing. Or Jonah Yellowman, after Trump had gutted Bears Ears by 85%. And what he said was, how are you going to go deeper? How do we go deeper? Which is the question that I, I left all of us with. And so I'm thinking about those things. A woman like Evangie Gray, who is fighting, has been fighting for 30 years to get the state of Utah to give their, her people water. And the town of Blanding refuses. 30 years. Um, and we are seeing how, how can that change now where we are, are trying to be good allies. I'm, I can't believe I did not know that as a member of the state of Utah. You know, shame on me. And, and she is leading with other women. They call themselves the women of Bears Ears. You know, fierce um, actions on behalf of their families. Um, I think, in many ways, this book is about what I've learned from Native people. And again, these cycles, you know, I did my master's thesis on Navajo storytelling, and my thesis was rejected in the... I guess there's a pattern here. Um, <laughs> you know, of, I, they failed me. I did not receive my master's degree because in the College of Education they said I didn't play by the rules, that it was too creative, it wasn't what I set out to do, which was directed reading in Navajo studies. And it was so boring. I thought if I'm skipping and skimming, then this has, you know, I'm wasting paper. Um, and in the end, they finally gave it to me five years later um, as an afterthought. But, but to realize that you know, in my early 20s, that I was obsessed with story and, and really looking um, at the Diné. You know, what stories do we tell that evoke a sense of place? And I taught on the reservation, you know. I could never have imagined, just like with Susan, that 30 years later, we would be literally in the trenches together as allies. Um, and that the conservation community in Utah would not be leading, but following. Um, it's been deeply humbling and deeply gratifying. And, you know, just this. Um, one night, we were all on a bus together, um, Native people, white people, you know, brown people, black people. We were, it, was, it was this beautiful um, moment in Utah of, of, of community. And I was sitting with Jonah, who's a medicine person, and I wasn't saying much. Dan had just died. And Jonah took my hand and he said, you know, it's not good for the community when you're sad. And I didn't know it was recognizable. And one day, Jonah just showed up. And he said, I'm here to do ceremony for you. And in that moment, I experienced just an inkling of what they know. And since that ceremony, and I say this as friends, you know, I have not been able to access the grief that I had experienced before that or after. That somehow it was, it, it, um, it was absorbed by everything else. That's sort of what I've learned. Um, thank you so much for this, and I'm not closing it, I'm asking a question. Um, since we are at a Women Lit event, I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about really the um, role, the changing role of feminism and feminine spirituality um, in light of climate crisis and uh, sort of the ecological crisis, how things are changing and moving, looking you know, at Susan's book, Women in Nature, um, just where you see things today. And I want to open that to you, because I feel like your book with the column is, is about that, and the way in which you're looking at Hinduism and climate change um, and women. 
Um, I think, you know, one of the things that for me with the Feeding a Thousand Souls book, a recognition, was, I mean, like erosion, you know, my book is also layers and layers of unfolding meaning as you go on this adventure of from not knowing to knowing some, a little bit about something, you know, <laughs> in a way. Um, and one of the, the last dis discoveries for me was, you know, this whole notion of feeding a thousand souls, why did women keep saying that? And I discovered that in an ancient Sanskrit religious task, text, the Dharma Shastras, in a footnote, it talked about the great sin of building a house, of becoming a householder. And the idea was that when you build a house, you are displacing all the souls, all the species that lived in that space. And there's no way you can be forgiven for that as a human being. And so the least you can do is to create these rice flower designs mm. and feed a thousand souls as the first ritual act of the day after, right after you brush your teeth mm. at dawn, right before dawn. And these rice flower designs are literally, it's edible art. So it's literally eaten by earthworms and birds and squirrels and small creatures. And I guess, you know, what that, and you know, of course, Indians have forgotten that. <laughs> it's forgotten knowledge. People say, like, feeding a thousand souls, but they didn't really know what it meant. Um, and I guess part of, for me, in terms of religion and climate is, or multi, you know, comparative religions and climate, is that, you know, every religious tradition, I think, has something deep to offer us as a solution, as well as a, creating a problem, you know, in, their, in terms of their perception. But if one just looks at the half of the solution part, for example, like even Jewish traditions, you know, I was stunned, like the whole idea of, Sabbath. And I thought, what if everybody, all eight billion of us, decided to take Sabbath from technology, from energy, from carbon, one day a week? That would create one eighth less energy use. It would be stunning. You know? And I think each religious tradition can perhaps offer an idea that would take us to draw down. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, I mean, there's all these layers of community, and religion is just one of many ways of organizing ourselves. It's not the only, even though I'm a professor of religious studies. <laughs> um, there's many, many ways of community organizing, but I think you know, religion has deep, deep roots. And if we can, if we can somehow massage it, <laughs> um, you know, following Susan Griffin and many other traditional texts and rituals. And the other thing I, thought, I think about in terms of religion and climate is rites of initiation. It's one of the things I teach a class on the commons in, uh, at USF, and one of the things my students were talking, we were talking about the other week is, what if we had climate rites of initiation? You know, instead of a driver's license, you had a carbon license when you were 16, that you earned a competency of how to be a human being with living in balance with carbon. Hmm. And you, you, know, you would have, just like we'd have the different rituals of coming of age, you know, ceremonies, you would imagine, we could imagine together, both collectively and individually, rites of initiation of climate. Hmm. And eight billion of us in many, many different ways. You know? And so I think that, I, I just, I don't know, I just believe in our imagination. I just think we have a tremendous imagination. And sometimes you have to find it in an ancient Sanskrit literary textual footnote. <laughs> you know, um, and even my book is out of a footnote. I love footnotes. Obviously, I'm a scholar, so I love footnotes. I think the, the jewels of learning are there that can't be fit into the regular text. So that's why sometimes you just jump from footnote to footnote. But, <laughs> but I think, you know, the climate, I think that's one of the ways to think about climate. Uh, I love Paul Hawkins' drawdown. You know, I think the idea of a U-turn is very powerful. Um, and I think, I think even if we're given a 10% chance to make it, or a 15% chance, just we'll take it. Let's take it and run. Hmm. So. <laughs> yeah. There's more people coming. The only thing I would add is I just, you know, when you talk about what women do yes. 
and with the column and climate. You know, I look at the leadership that we have from Nancy Pelosi to Greta Thunberg to AOC to Wangari Mathai, who has passed. But when I really look at leadership on the planet, I see it from women um, of all generations. And I think that's really um, powerful. And going back to Malcolm's question, um, when I think about Bears Ears, the women of Bears Ears are the ones that are holding the ground. And they are asking all women to hold the ground with them and speak. And so I think if, if we as women speak what we know in our bodies, um, when there's no one there to correct us, the world is shifting. <laughs> so the, the idea is women speak. Um, whole line of people now all of a sudden. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Laura. Um, I have a question. I guess it's about finding meaning in grief. Um, my mom died in 2018, so I'm 26 now and she was 56 when she died. Um, and you talked about experiencing, like, realizing that your brother's body was the same weight in death as in birth, and that there's this collective intake of breath, there's tremendous meaning in that realization. Um, and I, the question I want to ask is about how to look for meaning like that. Um, how do we find these kind of circular reinforcing meanings or numbers that um, take on weight and help us process grief, and are they connected to place? What a beautiful question, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, Thanks. My mom's name is Lisa. Thank you for giving us that. I'm just, you know, I, I was 28 when I lost my mother, so I really appreciate where you are. Meaning. You know, I think again of my grandmother when she talked about synchronicity. Um, when the outer landscape is in correspondence with the inner landscape, um, there is meaning. And for me, meaning, the most meaning thing, meaningful aspect of my life is the capacity to be present. And I think when we are present with one another, with the land, with our grief, then there is great meaning to be found. And I don't even know what that means, except for that I am alive, and that I am in the... When I am present, I'm not afraid. And when I'm not afraid, um, something can happen. And I, I think about um, Shinran, the 14th century Buddhist poet. And there were two lines, and I don't even know how this relates to your question, but it's coming to my mind and I trust it. The two lines that he wrote um, that I remember are, this happened now something else can occur. That has great meaning for me um, when I'm facing my grief. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious, as um, we feel our own sense of sacred rage and uh, become ourselves on our path that, that we have, I find myself um, thinking about the next generation. I'm in my 40s, I have um, s s children, and um, I find myself in the place of, of teaching uh, younger children about uh, 
climate and, and awareness. And my question is this, um, kind of goes back to that idea of the headlights and how far you can see in the light. Do either of you have thoughts about how far we should be shining the light or shielding children from the darkness in this moment? Um, and how effective we can be in that sacred rage if, you know, how far do we shine our light for them to see and to be part of that conversation? This is, these are such great questions. You know, one thing that just comes into my mind, I remember Marty Murray, who is viewed as the grandmother of conservation. She was a mentor of mine. Um, she lived to be 103. When I graduated from high school, she wrote me this note I found not long ago, and it said, Dear Terry, don't worry about what you're going to do next. My father always told me there was just enough light shining on the next step to give you enough light for the next one. And that has helped, that has fueled me because I've never known where I was going. I just saw enough light on the next step to get me there. And that if I was paying attention, if I was present, then that was far enough. And I think in so many ways, erosion is about night vision. And I actually remember um, driving with Barry Lopez uh, years ago in Oregon, in the, on the road to, to Fin Rock, and, you know, huge trees, as you know, and it's dark. It's not like desert dark, it's really dark. And he turned off his headlights. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is interesting, you know? <laughs> and he said, don't panic, your eyes will adjust. And they did. And that also has been instructive. I'm not sure we need headlights at this point. Um, I feel like we just need to let our eyes adjust and our pupils expand um, to take in um, what is before us. And I think the last thing I would say, and then VG, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm a grandmother now, and I'm, it's so thrilling. And... Uh, <laughs> Our son is from Rwanda, and he married a Rwandan woman named Rosette, and they have two children, and Malka is now two. And she calls me Tate Blanca, the white grandmother. <laughs> and what I love is, you know, they live in Washington, D.C., and Louis thinks we're crazy because, you know, it, everything is birds and animals and plants and earth. And, you know, they always say you skip a generation. Well, Malka is obsessed with animals and birds. And what I love is that she goes, when I see her, every time I see her or on video chat, she goes, Tate Blanca, outside, outside, outside. <laughs> and I just think the most powerful thing we can do is take our children outside and the rest will be taken care of. Thank you. I think I really believe in the intelligence and wisdom of children. I have twin 19-year-old, and, and they've been teaching me since they were two or two and a half, and correcting me at different times <laughs> for various reasons. <laughs> and so I think, and I've also taught fourth through eighth grade, you know, environmental science. Um, and, I, and I just, I think at this point, I think we need to let the children know what's actually going on. Mm. And I think it's okay. I think they can handle it. And I think they're actually going to, we can all work together. It's not, a, it's not the same kind of hierarchy as it used to be, mm. as we can see right in front of us. Um, the children are, because they're facing this particular crisis from an edge that we can't even know what that edge is. And I trust that edge that they can see th with. And I think we just need to like hold hands with them and go forward together as equals. Yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a, an easy one. It, 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 it's about footnotes. Um, one of um, my most really important teachers was um, Laura Nader, 
and she taught a course called the Anthropology of Law. And um, she started talking about legal writing. And um, I want to try this one out on you. Um, she says, well, you know, everything has to have a, a footnote. It has to have authority, you know, that, um, you know, because you don't have a paper. And she, she took this, this whole class of UC Berkeley real smart people and said, well, have you wondered how hard it is to think of a new idea if everything has to have a footnote? <laughs> and uh, I was wondering what you, you thought about that. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I love Laura Nader's work. I think she's amazing. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I really believe in also in a world of orality. And I think, you know, even though we don't think of footnotes in the world of orality, I think stories within stories are a kind of like a referencing map. Uh, and all footnotes, in a way, is acknowledgments, you know, acknowledgments of those people who helped us get there um, and ideas that, came, that, that we are building on others. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, are, these, are there questions over here? David, do you have a question? Are there questions? No, I think okay. they're just standing there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, with this beautiful conversation with all of you, I just want to say thank you and blessings. And thank, thank you. you, dear friend. Mm -hmm. So let's give a and big And thank you to you.